Hey, Colonial Woods family and all of those who are joining us today, it's a joy to be able to be with you this midweek just to bring, I hope, an encouraging word from God's Word. Some of you are joining that are part of our church family or some of you are from the greater Blue Water area. Some of you are, are around the world and we just want to say uh, welcome to you today. Well, we have uh, just come through uh, our Easter season. In fact, I kind of still consider us a little bit in it. And in that series of Chosen, which focused us right toward Easter, we focused on the life of Peter. Um, if you happen to have joined us on the weekend messages, uh, we talked about how to avoid a spiritual downfall as we looked at the life of Peter. And then this last week, our Easter resurrection focus was on the life of Peter again and how the empty tomb spoke into Peter's life, how it represented for him forgiveness, favor, which is God's smile, and then also provided a foundation for his life and legacy of ministry as he held firm in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, what I'd like to do over the next several weeks is to focus in on one of Peter's uh, writings to the churches that were under a time of incredible difficulty. It actually comes out of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, and I'm going to be focusing in on this over the next several weeks together. About 20 years ago, I had the privilege of being at a Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire conference with Jim Cimbala of Brooklyn Tabernacle. And uh, besides the Lord ministering to me through Jim's ministry, he introduced me to a guy that I've heard many times uh, about, but I really hadn't spent a whole lot of time looking and reading his writings, and it's Warren Wearsby. Now, for some of you, that name will ring a bell just for years and decades. He's been a faithful servant of the Lord. But um, Warren Wearsby got up, and in about five or ten minutes, he looked at this passage of Scripture, and when he read it, it just came alive to me. In fact, in me, it created a tremendous love for the book of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Now, I've always had an affinity for Peter anyway, just because he's a guy who had lots of potential, had lots of blunders, but he had also, the Lord had lots of grace in him, and so I kind of identify with him. And so we're going to be taking a look at that over the next several weeks together. Now, Peter was writing to a church who was going through some incredibly challenging times. Um, they were under the rule of Nero about 32 years uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nero was the emperor of Rome. If you know anything about church or world history, uh, Nero, uh, the, the famous saying was, is that Nero played his violin while Rome burned. I don't know if that literally happened or not, but it was a, it was a historic phrase to simply indicate that Nero did nothing while Rome burned. Most historians agree uh, in fact, most of the individuals of those days accused Nero of being just so, so bored with power that he actually began to burn sections of Rome just so that he would have something to rebuild. And politically, that might get you in a little bit of trouble. And so the, the, the tide began to turn against Nero, and Nero knew that, and because of that, he needed to find someone that he could blame. Well, who better than just simply these pacifist, friendly, loving individuals, a little bit quirky in their, in their culture anyway, these followers of the way, the followers of Christ, these Christians. And so the Christians began about 62 to 64 A.D., going through some tremendous persecution. Up until that time, most of the persecution had come really from Jews and the Jewish uh, Judaizers. But, boy, when you get into, the, into around AD 60, they began to go under tremendous persecution by um, economically as well as uh, physically. And when you began to hear about all the attacks in the Christian church, that's when it was happening. He's writing to those people. He was writing to a people who had... Uh, kind of a moral uncertainty because the culture around them was going crazy. Um, they had a, a, a physical uncertainty because their lives were being threatened. They had an economic uncertainty because obviously uh, persecution impacts your, your ability to even work and earn a living. Does that sound familiar? We live in a day of tremendous uncertainty. We've got uh, uncertainty in our area of health. Just this morning, I was on the phone with a young man who was a pastor, um, in fact, one of our pastors that we've helped plant a church with who is recovering from COVID-19. Um, we have a lot of uncertainty right now in our health. We have a lot of uncertainty in our economy. 
Um, while you may be being cared for right now, the fact is, is that none of us really know what life in the United States, life in North America, life in our world is going to look like in, in the next several months. And so there's a lot of uncertainty with that. Uh, we have political uncertainty because uh, right now you've got accusations from both sides that it's either going to be a socialist or it's going to be a, an arrogant madman or somewhere in between. And there's this, all this uncertainty in this world. There's a lot of uncertainty even in our families in these days. God's Word has a way of honing in that when you are going through times of uncertainty, when you are going through times of challenge, when you're going through times of suffering, when you're going through the fire, where do you turn? Peter, in the last few words that he gives to this church in this first letter that he writes, Peter writes some words that are incredibly encouraging. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says these words, And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself, I love this, that's a personal word, He will Himself personally restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. When you're going through a hard, difficult time, it's kind of like you got to focus your attention somewhere else. Peter says if you need to focus, number one, you need to look up. You need to look up and see the God of unlimited resources. Notice what he says in this passage. And the God of of all grace. Key word is grace. In fact, the word grace is a theme not only in the New Testament, certainly in Paul's writings, but the word grace is a theme throughout Peter's uh, uh, letter that he wrote to the New Testament churches. Over and over again, he talks about the grace that we have because of being chosen, that we are God's elect strangers in this world, that uh, is by His grace being poured out on us, that we endure through grace, we go through suffering by grace. And he says that we have the God of all grace. Grace. I I've shared with you many times that uh, uh, an acronym I year learned years ago, many, maybe you did too, uh, uh, that grace is an acronym, right? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Everything we have is a gift given by God, paid for by the cross of Jesus Christ. But when we talk about grace, I find that grace is a word that we use a lot, but we've underdefined. I, I think a lot of times we, we maybe aren't incorrect in what we say, we're just incomplete <laughs> in what we say. And it's interesting because when I was thinking about this, there are really three categories of grace. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the first one, but there's common grace, right? Common grace is available to everyone in the world. Uh, Jesus said, what, Matthew chapter 4? He said that it, 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 the sun shines on the evil as well as the innocent. Uh, the rain sh uh, showers upon the righteous as well as the unrighteous. The fact is, is that when the sun shines and it's a beautiful day out, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or don't believe in God. Whether you're a follower of Christ or not, you're a recipient of God's smile. When God nourishes the earth, he, the fact is, is when God nourishes the earth, it falls on the just as well as the unjust. And so God's grace, if you look for it, is actually all over our world. We see the common grace of God all over. But then he talks about two categories of grace that I think are specifically for the believer in Jesus Christ. And there's, number one, relational grace. We have a relationship with God through grace. In fact, what does Scripture say? It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God because God doesn't want anyone to be able to boast. We have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the gift of God. It's our faith in Him, sure, but it's His gift to us through Jesus Christ. I love what it says in Romans. Romans uh, chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access access 
by faith into the grace by which we now stand. So here's the deal. When, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it opens up access to resources of heaven that otherwise you would not have had. We have a relationship, right? We have, we're saved through grace. Um, you could say that we're sanctified by grace. Uh, Paul says that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says uh, that he believes that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. So God not only rescues you and saves you by grace, but he sanctifies you by grace. He continues to do that, that purifying work in your life as we look more and more like him. You might even say we have sustaining grace. Jude 24 and 25 says, To him who is able to keep you from falling. I love that. That God is actually able to hold you steady and keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I love the rest of it too. To our only God and Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages and forevermore. We have a relationship through grace. Oh, man, that's incredible. Now, I'm going to guess that most of the time that you've been in a church, you've probably heard that. If, if you grew up in a church, or uh, if you spent your childhood, or you've been in church for any number of years, more than likely, you probably already knew that. I'm saved by grace, right? You've heard that. That is not wrong, but it is incomplete. Grace is so much deeper than simply being saved, sanctified, and sustained. God's grace goes so much deeper in our life. I love what the Gospel of John writes. It says this in John chapter 1, verse 16. He says, From the fullness of His grace we have all received one blessing after another. We are just blessed, and we're blessed, and we're blessed, and we're blessed. Over and over, all the riches, all the resources of heaven, by grace. I love the story of the, the millionaire businessman who was in deep financial need. He needed money. So he decided to go to his local church, go down to the altar, and spend a little bit of time in prayer. He gets there, begins crying out to God for for over a million dollars and he's sitting next to a guy who's also there desperate just a common ordinary guy and the guy's begging God for a hundred bucks and uh, so this this uh, businessman gets up takes his wallet out gives the guy a hundred bucks I mean the guy is so ecstatic thanks the Lord praises God runs out of the church the businessman gets back down at the altar and he says okay now that I have your undivided attention <laughs> it's this idea that God's only got so much attention and resources for one thing at a time that's not true God has unlimited resources in fact, He is working in ways that you can't even imagine, even in today. So we can cry out to Him. It reminds me of the story in the Old Testament of Elijah. And Elijah, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, now we talked about the story of how Elijah went through a dry time, and we remember the story of how Elijah fought the, uh, the uh, prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Uh, but Elijah comes to the end of his rope. He's greatly discouraged because he feels like he's in this whole thing of ministry alone. And he gets to a point of discouragement, despair, and even desperation when he begins to just cry out to God. And God begins to show up in his life and basically says, Elijah, what are you here for? What, what's, what's your problem? And Elijah begins to, to really... Uh, complain to the Lord. And here's what he says. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And I love what the Lord says. <laughs> I have yet, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. God looks at Elijah and he says, Elijah, you may feel like I've tapped out. I have resources you haven't even dreamt of. 
Let's take a look at the several of them. We've already talked about saving grace, sanctifying grace, sustaining grace, but let's talk about some of the resources that are ours through Jesus Christ. They're serving grace. It's the ability to serve God. To pour ourselves out. Now, Peter certainly talks about that when he says, whatever grace you have, whatever grace you've received from the Lord, or received from the Lord, use it to serve the saints in the body of Christ. But Paul says this. He says, uh, I, I am the least of the apostles. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if any of you are writing these down. Verse 9, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. And I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. Paul says, I am saved by grace. But that grace so motivated me to want to serve the Lord that I am pouring myself out to try to honor Him with the rest of my life. And even my pouring myself out, it isn't because of me, it's because of His grace working in me. Grace, 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 right? Um, you can also sacrifice by grace. Sacrificing means that I'm giving to, I'm giving of myself as much as I can and even beyond what I can. I love this. This is in actually 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is talking about giving and being generous. And he talks about the Macedonian church, which is one of the poorest churches that is known at that time. And he says this, My brothers, we want all of you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial." Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testified that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Now, how in the world do you do that? How do you give more than what you have? I was actually talking to a pastor not long ago. And he was just simply thanking the Lord for his generosity to his church. And he said, you know, we have determined, we're one of those churches, we've been blessed, we have determined to make a large investment into a kingdom ministry. We're just, we're just waiting to see what that kingdom ministry is. What's interesting, he said, but the problem is, is that every time we give away, the, God blesses us so much that we, we have more than what we started with. And so we just keep giving it away. God has got a bigger shovel than you do. And it doesn't matter if it's finances or if it's your energy. Have you ever done that? You've given yourself into something. You've given it your all. And somewhere where you didn't even understand it, you gave more than you even thought you had to give. Just pouring yourself out sacrificially. We have suffering grace. Do you realize that there's a grace that enables us to stand under a heavy load? Um, the word endurance in Scripture is the word that means to stand under a heavy load. And do you realize that God is able to give you the grace to endure suffering? Paul did that. Paul talks about the fact that he had a thorn in his flesh. We believe it was a physical illness that he had. We believe it was likely very, very poor eyesight. Uh, Paul, in his later writings, illustrates that he's not even able to actually write by his own hand. He needs someone else to help him because his eyesight is so poor. So we assume that's maybe what he's talking about. But whatever the suffering is in your life that you've asked God to take away, because he begged God to take it three times, this word's for you. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said three times, I pleaded to the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I know some of you are going through physical challenge, and I know you've begged God to take it away. And you know what? I'm going to keep begging that God would take it away. But in the meantime, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. I know some of you are in some really hard relationships. I've spoken with you. And I want God to make it all better. I really do. I want him to repair and restore, and I believe God will. 
But he said, don't quit. My grace is sufficient. Some of you are in a hard career right now. It's hard. My grace is sufficient. Some of you, just because you're part of this world, we're going through this whole COVID-19 thing. You apply it into your world. He said, I want you to know my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is, is perceived and my power is revealed in your weakness. By the way, not just that, I, I would call that supporting grace. It's the, it's, the, it's the ability to go through, right? That's suffering grace. But it's also the ability to stand up. Supporting grace, when you feel like your knees are going to give out. Grace. Singing grace. I love that one. Now I know some of you are, you, you, you are saying, uh, I've heard a few people sing. They need a little more grace. Uh, this, is not, this is not about performance, nor is it about the eloquence of a person's voice. It is the song that bubbles out of their soul as God fills them with a new song, as Scripture talks about. By the way, Colossians chapter 3 tells us that, that we, we want to have the peace of God rule in our hearts. We want the Word of Christ to dwell richly in us uh, as we teach and admonish one another. And then he says, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That Spiritual songs are songs. What we tend to find is that, is that psalms tend to be like what we would call choruses today right? Um, hymns tend to be um, statements or scriptural references about who God is, but spiritual songs refers to songs of the Spirit that bubble from our soul. And, and, they, and he says, I, I want you to have that ability by God's grace. Now, I just can't think of a better. Now, we see them all over Scripture, right? I mean, David certainly was a, a man who was able to sing by grace, but the one that I think of is when Paul and Silas and Acts chapter 16, they're in a, a Roman jail. Tremendous uncertainty. Uh, more than likely, at least in their mind, they're going to die the next day. I probably would have been uh, maybe writing my resignation letter. I would have been thinking about my last will and testament. Might have been thinking about something I want to make sure I tell my kids or my wife says they were singing about midnight. I've always been so blessed by that. I, I, wonder, I wonder what they were singing, right? Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Or maybe they were singing, uh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. There is no doubt in my mind that the ability to sing a song from the soul in the midst of prison and suffering is an expression of the grace of God pouring into their lives. There are so many different kinds of grace. I mean, we touched a few. There's dying grace, right? It's the grace that meets an individual at the end of life that gives them peace, ushers them into the presence of the Lord. Um, what is... Uh, uh, Many of us know Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that, that saves us, uh, a wretch like me. The third stanza goes like this. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The more I read Scripture, the more I understand God's grace is unlimited. We had a theme passage that we used for um, our series, Chosen. It was out of Ephesians chapter 1, 3, and 4. Let me read it to you again before we close. 
Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, get this, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every resource of heaven. Think about how big His resources are. There is a grace that reaches everyone. There is the grace that we have to have relationship with Jesus Christ. There's the resource grace for those who are in relationship with Him. When you're walking through the fire, when you're going through an uncertain time, when you're going through a hardship, a suffering, look up to the God of all grace. He giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more grace when the labors increase to added affliction. He addeth His mercy to multiplied trials, His multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth. And he giveth, and he giveth again. Father, thank you for the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. Expand our horizon to understand that not only are we saved and sustained by your grace, but your grace abundantly provides every moment, even in this hour of uncertainty. Pour out your grace, which we know is sufficient and made perfect in our time of weakness. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have an incredible, grace-filled week.